It is Friday, April 23rd, let's talk PlayStation. So you're not going to believe this, but we actually had a mostly positive news week for PlayStation, if you can believe that. Uh, it seems like it's been a, <laughs> a long few months, my cat's playing with her toy on the floor. Uh, but we've got a good amount to go over. Let's start off, as always, with our PS Plus reminder. The April games are available right now. You still have a lot of time to grab these. But as an additional reminder, the Play at Home initiative, Horizon Zero Dawn, is available right now. The complete edition, by the way, so make sure you grab this because it also includes that Frozen Wilds DLC, which I know a lot of people may have potentially missed. And that'll be available until May 14th. And we'll actually find out relatively soon uh, what other games will be available as part of the Play at Home initiative. So it's not just ending here. There is more content coming. And Sony will tell us what that is very soon. Now getting into our first positive news story, it looks like review codes for Returnal have been sent to the press, and so far, even though as of recording this right now, not many people have gotten to play a whole lot of the game, it seems like they're only allowed to talk about the first hour, the first few hours, and we actually have footage of the first hour of the game released online right now, which I won't show any of that footage out of respect to people that want to go on a media blackout for the game, but we are hearing that everyone's really enjoying the game so far, and what we will cover is some of the additional details that we have learned uh, for that short, short amount of time that people have been playing the game. So we know the game is running in a dynamic 4K resolution, 60 FPS with ray trace lighting. So we know this game looks gorgeous um, and all the particle effects really do look fantastic, but it is a dynamic 4K. Not entirely surprising, I would imagine the game is hovering around 1600p to maybe 1800p uh, for most of the gameplay when it really gets intensive. Uh, we're also seeing really great use of the haptics and 3D audio. So the one thing we're seeing with the haptics is when it's raining, you can feel all the little uh, individual raindrops in the DualSense controller. That seems really cool. I love that they're uh, making great use of that. Uh, the alt firing mode. So apparently when you do press this halfway down, that's when the, um, the alt fire mode can get activated. And a lot of people were a little concerned that maybe that feels a little bit weird but we're hearing so far that this is actually very intuitive and it's not nearly as foreign as one would think and you can actually get used to it uh, with enough play time there's also a warning screen telling you that the game is meant to be challenging and that if you want to save the progress of your current run which you're not really meant to do but if you want to um, you're actually recommended to put the console in rest mode and that way when you boot up your ps5 again you'll be right where you left off but otherwise if you close the game out or something like that you will be transport it back to the crash site because remember it's a roguelike so you are going to die and lose your progress and things like that it's meant to be like that so um, if you want to save your current run that's what you would have to do i am honestly so thrilled to see a lot of positive press for the game come out because when it comes to you know the playstation 5 lineup so far and for me personally this has always been the one title that's been very high on my radar because i love housemark games i've put so much time into stuff like Brazil Gun and Super Stardust HD, and so I've really been fascinated with Returnal because this is their biggest project up to this point. They're finally tying a narrative directly to the gameplay, and it's still very much that bullet hell fashion that they're known for. So for me, this title has actually been quite high on my list compared to probably most other people. Um, and I'm just so pleased to see that despite you know the high price tag and the fact that it's not going to be a game for everybody, I'm just happy to see that the conversation so far around it is looking quite good. Now, of course, the one big news story that I'm sure a lot of you have probably seen up to this point is that Sony has reversed their decision on closing the PlayStation Store on PS3 and PS Vita. So they're still closing it for PSP. That'll be July 2nd. And I think most are kind of okay with that because actually if you want to keep buying PSP content digitally, you can actually do that from a PlayStation 3 or continue to play PSP digital software from a Vita. Thus, you can still purchase it that way. But PSP facing transactions will be shut down still July 2nd. However, over on the PS blog, SI President CEO Jim Ryan did actually write this up himself and he says, When we initially came to the decision to end purchasing support for PS3 and PS Vita, it was born out of a number of factors, including commerce support challenges for older devices and the ability for us to focus more of our resources on newer devices where a majority of our gamers are playing on. We see now that many of you are incredibly passionate about being able to continue purchasing classic games on PS3 and PS Vita for the foreseeable future, so I'm glad we were able to find a solution to continue operations. I'm glad that we can keep this piece of our history alive for gamers to enjoy while we continue to create cutting-edge new game worlds for PS4, PS5, and the next generation of VR. So, this is fantastic news, it really is, especially because we all know Jim Ryan's trying to create a better dialogue 
with the hardcore PS customer in relation to a topic like this, where we all know he's not going to be able to walk away from that 2017 quote where it's still biting him years later uh, because he was at a Gran Turismo event saying the PS1 and PS2 games looked ancient. And the thing is, we've been doing LTPS since mid to late 2012. We covered that story three, four years ago. I didn't like it either. I thought it was polarizing, out of touch, especially for somebody of his rank so high in the company. It's still not a very good quote, and it's still going to haunt him forever. But at least for right now, this was the right decision because when this whole thing was announced, my gut reaction was too soon. And that's the thing. It's still inevitable. It is. The stories are not going to go forever. I just thought 2024, 2025, and we would get like a year notice, and that's not what happened. And that's what was so ridiculous about this whole thing. Not only were customers not properly warned, but also developers weren't warned either. There's a lot of active... Uh, PlayStation Vita development that was still going and they weren't told either so that's what was so infuriating about this whole thing at least to me but uh, what people do need to remember is that these stores are very old it's outdated network infrastructure and I mean at some point they are in all likelihood going to close I mean Sony could make a massive investment and move all the content over to a new store specifically for PlayStation 3 and Vita and that would be a massive undertaking for what still is goodwill. So keeping these stores running, they in all likelihood are not um, generating a, enough revenue to really be completely offset. Maybe they are, but it, you know, if that, um, I know some are thinking, oh, they made all this money because they announced the closure, so people are panic buying. I guarantee you even that was probably a very minor uptick, if that, to really make any sort of meaningful push. This is very much a goodwill situation of them keeping the stores open for what I would hope as what I was expecting, at least 2024. Um, but I do expect them to close at some point. And this is why PlayStation 3 in particular is in such a weird spot. You know, whether it's cell or the network infrastructure, even something like PSN ID name changes, we saw how fragmented and ridiculous that that is. There's a hard cutoff of April 2018 for official support from a development standpoint. If you go back further with a changed ID, uh, then that's where you could run into issues. I mean, PlayStation 3 is fascinating and as great of a console as it is, it's in a weird history that Sony just is... You know, it's tough to deal with, right? It's hard to bring those games forward and it's hard to keep the store running. So for now, at least I'm happy that the deadline has been pushed back indefinitely. Uh, and in the somewhat related notion of the CMOS battery issue where if that died and let's say we're in a you know two decade future where there's no PSN connectivity for PS3, you wouldn't be able to authenticate your purchases. So that's a part that could fail and then you lose access to all your digital games even if they're saved offline. Uh, we also are apparently seeing that some people have been reaching out to Sony support and they are acknowledging that they're looking into it. I don't know if we'll see anything super meaningful out of that, uh, but it would be something as simple as a firmware update making it so that that little you know, CMOS battery isn't 100% required to actually play that offline content and certainly for PS4 and eventually uh, PlayStation 5 as well, which is another bad news story that got out because PS5, same deal there, has that little CMOS battery. But if Sony can properly address these things, then it would look very good for what will be decades of potential ownership for all this content that people care very much about. Next up, if you recall, we had our first major PS5 system software update, which gave us a lot of new features and changes to the UI. And we also had a new update for the DualSense controller, which we had no idea if that actually did anything. But it seems like within the last week or so, people have been reporting anecdotally that the rumble functionality for PS4 games on PS5 has been improved greatly because technically when you're playing with the DualSense, it's not rumble. The DualSense does not have two weighted motors. It has little actuators and that's what produces the haptic feedback. But it seems like Sony's actually simulated the rumble functionality better for those PS4 games, which means it could feel a lot more aggressive than it otherwise would have before this update. So that's the one benefit that we're now seeing to the DualSense controllers actually taking on their own software updates internally. Moving on to our next news story, if you remember when we covered the February MPD numbers, PS5 was the fastest selling console in the US in terms of dollar sales, but not quite unit sales. It was less than 1% behind PS4 when your launch aligned. And it turns out that for the March MPD, PS5 is still the fastest selling console in the US in terms of dollar sales, but also unit sales as well now. So it looks like PlayStation 5 is still doing incredibly well. It's now exceeding PlayStation 4 in the US in terms of units. And it just goes to show that the console is still in hot demand. People really want this thing. 
and that's despite a global pandemic and a massive semiconductor shortage where Sony's still making more of these things versus PS4 and getting them out there. And on average, it costs more than PS4. It's still doing really well. Uh, I would really love to see just how many they could sell if there was no if there was no artificial ceiling or it's not artificial there these are very real problems but if there was no ceiling in terms of manufacturing these things um, i just wonder what the end of that demand would look like to where you could comfortably go to a store or order one online no problem we're also learning that spider-man miles morales has already exceeded the sales of the last of us part two and ghost of tsushima in the u.s and that also just proves that for the spider-man ip despite this being a shorter game or you know expanded content turned into a full game however you want to phrase it it was still incredibly popular and people just love spider-man and they love this story that was told with miles morales and you know granted it's on ps4 and ps5 but the one thing that we're also seeing is in the uk sales chart for physical data that we have it seems like the game always charts on playstation 5 and not ps4 so every time more ps5 console replenishments go out in the uk the ps5 version is always the one that's charting so that tells you that for very engaged consumers they're often buying that PS5 version instead of the PS4 one. Now, while we're on the topic of PS5 stock and overall availability, we have a very interesting interview uh, with SIE President CEO Jim Ryan with Nikkei.com. We learned not a whole lot, but still some pretty good quotes here. First off, with PS5 supply, we have Jim Ryan saying, and I quote here, there are several reasons why PlayStation 5s are currently hard to obtain. Supply was extremely intricate under COVID-19 and distribution had to be online only. Semiconductor supply and demand is also tight across the globe. We are asking our suppliers to increase production and that will flow into the market in 2021. So hopefully the situation does get a little bit better. The thing is, we just talked about it. There's obviously more PS5s that are being made this time around versus PS4, or it's very close to it. Doesn't feel like it though, because it's in much higher demand versus what we saw with PS4 back in the day. I don't think, I think 2022 is when we'll get to that comfortable point of purchasing power. But right now, yeah, it's it's still going to be quite tough. Although it seems like Sony has been making a bigger marketing push for not only their software, but just the hardware in general. And that might be aligned with the fact that they do have more allocation of stock coming in. And hopefully that's pretty soon. Now, in the same interview, we do also have Jim Ryan responding to what Microsoft's been doing lately with all these very aggressive acquisitions and what could we see for PlayStation 5 or the software lineup with Sony. And Jim says, and I quote here, we have been quietly but steadily investing in high quality games for PlayStation and we will make sure that the PlayStation 5 generation has more exclusive software than ever before. We have engaged in mergers and acquisitions several times in the past, such as with Insomniac Games. We will not rule out that option in the future. So as I've said before a few times on this topic, it's not surprising at all. They always give this answer, which is they're always looking at mergers and acquisitions. It's just they're always much slower in this area. They're more methodical with how they evaluate uh, developers that make sense for it being acquired. They're not quite like Microsoft where they're just money hatting left and right. Now, Sony does this in situations like, you know, second party deals or, you know, timed exclusivity, which we've got plenty of examples of them doing that on PlayStation 5. I'm sure we'll see more of that. And I think that's more in veins of what Jim Ryan might be talking about here, not necessarily directly first party stuff, but we'll probably see more timed exclusives and uh, more of these second party games, which we'll talk about one uh, very soon here in a second. But they're always doing this, but when it comes to acquisitions, they are much slower in this area. And there are still a lot of usual suspects that Sony's worked with in the past that I think would make you know too much sense and i just i'm wondering when they'll actually tie the knot there but remember it's also it's a mutual thing right so when we talk about something like house mark or blue point or you know developer x y and z sometimes they might not even want to be acquired or not for the price that sony's willing to pay that's also something that we have to always consider here although depending on the developer and who you talk to sometimes they want that security that a platform holder like sony can bring them when they're acquired so they don't have to worry about um, finding their next publishing deal and trying to stay afloat in between those publishing deals as well. Now, in terms of Sony's cloud strategy, Jim Ryan did also comment on this as well and more specifically respond to the 2019 announcement of Sony and Microsoft announcing that partnership together where they would explore opportunities together. Jim Ryan said, and I quote here, the conversation of exchanging ideas with Microsoft is ongoing. It's some extremely interesting stuff, and I hope to announce our cloud strategy when the time is right. While we could use the cloud for our technical infrastructure, the cloud game experience we offer will be unique to PlayStation. 
that is the one thing that many seem to forget is that there was that 2019 announcement between Sony and Microsoft, but ever since then, nothing's happened actually. Sony still uses AWS for PS Now services, so they haven't actually done anything, but there is still a lot of room for improvement in this area. I'm one of the few people that will cover and talk about PS Now and actually use the service occasionally to show you all that, hey, it still work, works, it still exists, um, but it does have its fair share of problems and you know, people don't want to stream games. Um, so in the short term, it's great for downloading the PS2 and the PS4 content. But if you get down that latency, if you improve that image quality, I think that you could actually have a very compelling cloud streaming service that can coexist with, you know, having a traditional console and local play. That's the thing. I always say that we're in the land of options right now, because when it comes to playing games, you can play things locally, you can download, you've got subscription services coming in and cloud gaming, which is still in its early infancy. Microsoft's now rolling out more xCloud stuff, and Sony's had PS Now for the longest time, which people don't seem to care much for, but all the options are there. It's a matter of making them so much better, and for Sony, they do have a unique opportunity with PlayStation in that they have a vast library, they have this legacy of consoles that they can revisit, which I don't even really think they're probably going to do, but you know, they have every opportunity in the book to make PlayStation Now and cloud gaming so much more compelling than it really is. Um, if it's worth really investing right now, I'm not entirely sure, but Jim does make a point to say that he's more optimistic about it looking you know, better in the long term of the PlayStation 5 life cycle than um, previously thought. Now this is actually a great segue because Sony actually did announce something new for PS Now, which is 1080p streaming is finally rolling out. So over on Twitter, they did post this where it says PS Now will begin rolling out support for streaming 1080p capable games this week. The rollout will occur over the next several weeks across Europe, US, Canada, and Japan where PlayStation Now is available. So that's great to see because for the longest time it's been 720p and that's fine for the PlayStation 3 stuff. In fact, it doesn't look too bad considering a lot of PS3 games tend to look very ugly and because it's 720p and it's being streamed so you actually have a lot of artifacting it will soften the image of those 720p games so it doesn't look too bad but when you stream ps4 stuff it's like why would you even do that just download the ps4 games um, now what we need is a rollout of ps now to countries where it isn't available because there's still so much missing there when it comes to the overall availability of PS Now. And if you can't offer streaming there, at the very minimum, make sure you roll out the download feature for the PS2 and PS4 stuff. And then, you know, eventually if you are gonna still continue PS3 games, you can roll that out when it's possible, but it's not gonna be a priority, of course. I'm not sure how many people are really streaming PS3 games. In fact, I could honestly see, <laughs> I could honestly see them closing the PS3 games because they haven't added them in a very long time. I'm not sure how many people are really using them. Uh, I hope they don't, <laughs> but there is still the option of playing PS3 games today and you know, that's, that's how you would do it. I mean, honestly, if they keep the PS3 games around and they lower the latency, improve the image quality, and they can get it close to native play, then you've really got a situation where, hey, look, we've got 480 something PS3 games. I think that was my most recent count, um, which actually matches up quite well with how many Xbox 360 games are available on um, Microsoft's machines through their backwards compatibility program. Now, they have to be streamed, but if we're going just off of pure quantity, then Sony's actually not too bad in this area. Um, actually, for PS2 games as well, Sony has more PS2 games versus original Xbox games. This is something that nobody wants to be reminded of or, or talk about, and I'm not saying it's better than Microsoft's solution, but um, if we're going off the sheer amount of games that are available in terms of legacy content, there is something there on the PlayStation side of things. It's just, you know, it doesn't look like Sony's really trying or making any sort of meaningful push. Next up, if you recall, Sony recently signed a publishing deal with Jade Raymond's new studio, Haven Game Studios, and it looks like Sony's doing something similar again with a new publishing deal for a AAA multiplayer game out of the new studio, Firewalk Studios. So this is a team comprised of former Destiny veterans. The head of the studio, Tony Su, he was previously the general manager and senior vice president of Destiny at Activision. You've also got Ryan Ellis, he was previously the creative director at Bungie. You've got the executive producer, Elena Siegman, she was previously at Bungie, Irrational Games, Harmonix. So you've got a lot of very rich talent here that have formed the studio back in 2018. So actually this project is 
somewhat far along enough to actually be playable. So we're hearing that Herman Hulse has actually played this AAA multiplayer project and Sony has signed the deal on this. So it will be a console exclusive for PlayStation. Presumably it will see a day and date PC release. And I would imagine by the time this comes out, it would be strictly a PlayStation 5 game. So it looks like Sony has signed on a pretty big budget multiplayer project for PS5. The head of PlayStation Studios, Herman Hulse said, and I quote here to GameIndustry.biz, I see this as a strategic partnership that will allow us to continue evolving and exploring new territories for us. I believe that Firewalk's ambitious vision for its original multiplayer game is going to deliver something really fresh and exciting. From Sackboy to Astrobot to Dreams to these kinds of games that you're referring to, like The Last of Us Part 2 and Ghost of Tsushima, and you can bet that we will carry on making these games because they are at the heart and soul of what we do here at PlayStation Studios, but at the same time, we are just as committed to making these quality experiences as we are to experimentation and to coming up with fresh ideas. So, this deal in particular I find very noteworthy because for Sony, this is an area that they've been struggling with for a very long time, which is an exclusive multiplayer game something that they can really call their own and you know this is a project that will also launch on pc but you know with sony they have that reputation for the big triple a third person single player experiences and it seems like now they're kind of pigeonholed to only doing that despite all the other small projects that they may put out from second or even first party but the one thing that they have tried for quite a while is their own multiplayer project that can really be a, a huge knockout success and you can argue that they've had smaller successes but um, they haven't ha quite had their own Halo, their own Destiny, their own, you know, whatever, right? Um, in recent years, we've seen them try smaller things like Predator Hunting Grounds or, you know, franchises like Killzone, Resistance, which Resistance 2 had a pretty big push for the multiplayer stuff. Uh, PS3, you had things like Mag, Starhawk, Warhawk. Uh, they haven't really had that success that they saw with SOCOM on PlayStation 2, which bringing that up i know it immediately goes to well bring socom back or what have you right the thing is socom on ps3 didn't even really do all that well you could argue that's because of the quality of the game but uh keep in mind nowadays i i think in, in all fairness uh that kind of gameplay just wouldn't hold up to what most people are playing nowadays which is these twitchy fast-paced shooters the battle royales and whatnot there is you know, trends and genres that come and go with game development. It's just like anything else, right? So I think SOCOM wouldn't really be the, it wouldn't quite do as well as it did back in the day, right? But that is something that Sony had back in the PS2 generation. They haven't really had that since, um, or at least it hasn't really felt like that, right? So I think this is why Sony is still to this day exploring uh, multiplayer opportunities and seeing if they can make something or be a part of something that turns into a huge cash cow, right? Because this could certainly be more in the veins of, and we don't even know what this is, right? If it's a standalone, you know, $60, $70 game, uh, free to play, live service game, but whatever the case may be, multiplayer nowadays as a long-term title can really, can really do quite well, it can be very lucrative. And Sony's always wanted a piece of that and they just can't seem to, they can't seem to find um, that true gem. Next up, over on Twitter, we just learned that PlayStation is now an official sponsor of the Asobu development space in Japan, which is a uh, community workspace for smaller independent Japanese developers to use to work on and eventually release their own projects. And now Sony is sponsoring this space officially, which I would imagine looks like financial backing, uh, potentially community outreach for these developers to make sure that they can properly publish their games on the PlayStation storefront, but also maybe working out their own publishing deals directly with Sony. Not entirely sure. I would imagine it's a number of those things, but they are now supporting this space. And I would also gather that this is Sony making some calculated efforts to um, repair those relations with not only the Japanese development community, but just how it looks in general, right? I mean, that's the thing that has been levied against Sony so much uh, the past few months. And the thing is, we have a number of accounts where on a global scale, at least, Sony has very good developer outreach. But we also have plenty of examples where, you know, smaller teams feel like they're being shafted or they're not giving the support that they need. Probably depends on a number of factors. Sometimes you might just get a very bad uh, support person um, when you're trying to work directly with Sony. But it seems like more often than not, usually Sony's been pretty good in this area. I would hope they make some dramatic improvements here so we don't have another weird situation like selling Vita dev kits when we're apparently closing the store or not telling Vita developers much of anything or 
you know, not actually helping a number of developers get their dev kits and properly answer their questions when they need it so they can make sure that their software is ready to go and uh, properly ready to publish on the PlayStation Store. Uh, as long as the support is there for not only Japan, but developers worldwide, I'm happy. For our next news story, this initially leaked on Wednesday and then fully revealed yesterday, but a PlayStation Plus video pass is coming in a testing phase only in Poland as of right now, where you can watch over 20 back catalog Sony Pictures movies and TV shows on demand whenever you want as part of your PS Plus benefits. And that's it right now. So it's not global. It's only in Poland. They're testing it. And yeah, it seems a little strange, right? I think a lot of people saw this and thought to themselves who asked for this. Uh, especially when so many people are looking at things like Plus and now hoping for a dramatic improvement to combat, you know, something like Game Pass, which we just talked about last week. And the thing is, this is on the heels of them closing PlayStation View and um, closing down on-demand video content on the PlayStation Store. So clearly Sony's not making a massive push in the TV and video sector for the the gaming division but rather this really seems like an added benefit just utilizing the back catalog of sony pictures content which if that's purely all this is then you can't really argue against something additional for your plus membership even if it's something that you don't necessarily care about um if anything, I think that's fine. Actually do something with some anime content too, uh, because we know that Sony's heavily invested in the anime industry as well. So maybe do that, some of the Sony picture stuff. I think that's actually fine, assuming that it truly is an added benefit. And this isn't really the massive push that we're looking for when it comes to something like Plus and Now, right? I mean, I think we all know that that's not what this is, especially if they're just testing it right now. There's no guarantee that this will really roll out to everybody. So um yeah it's it's strange but we'll see if this really goes anywhere now moving on to our next news story you know we had to talk about this but once again over on david jaffe's youtube channel he had director john garvin on there former director of days gone and he had some choice words to say about when it comes to buying the game or buying the game at full price or a potential sequel i'm sure a lot of you saw this but he says and i quote here if you love a game buy it at effing full price i can't tell you how many times i've seen gamers say yeah i got that on sale i got it through ps plus or whatever once jaffe responds saying how do you know to pay full price for it if you haven't played it he says I'm just saying you don't, but don't complain if a game doesn't get a sequel if it wasn't supported at launch. And what followed this shortly after was the context of when Garvin worked on uh, Siphon Filter Dark Mirror on PSP, which we all know PSP was uh, plagued by piracy. And so he would look at the numbers of about 200,000 torrents for Dark Mirror, and that's actually a lot of units for what was a PSP game back in the day. Uh, not to say that those all would have been genuine sales, but you get my point, right? That's the context of it. So it was certainly a, an off-the-cuff, I think, pent-up frustration kind of comment there. Um, and on the heels of that, we also had a comment from Eric Jensen, lead designer at Ben Studio. He says over on Twitter, whether you picked up Days Gone on day one, borrowed it from a friend, watched someone else play it, or tried it with PS Now or PS Plus, I appreciate you. Thank you for playing our game. The outpouring of love and support for our game and our studio has been incredible. Jaffe was, of course, just trying to create a good dialogue on, you know, the potential of a sequel and how the game performed. And, of course, it coming out to a, you know, 70-something on Metacritic because it had poor performance and things like that. And since this video and it getting posted everywhere, John Garvin's, you know, responded saying he didn't necessarily mean it like that. Um, he takes full responsibility for it. In fact, he was very candid in that interview for a lot of what he talked about with why he left Sony Bend and kind of his management style and how that kind of all fell apart. So it is a very fascinating, interesting conversation between two industry industry veterans. But uh, yeah, it's something where <laughs> this caused a lot of heated conversation uh, over the weekend because this was from, I think, Friday, actually. So it's about a week old now at this point. Uh, we don't ha really have a whole lot of time to really dive into that conversation, but it is just, it is a, an off-the-cuff comment where it does sound like it's a lot of uh, just pent up frustrations from being a game developer for so long and seeing uh, situations where a game doesn't get a sequel and seeing so many fans ask for it but it's really out of his hands because at the end of the day it's Sony's decision as the big publisher where it's their IP too they own it right so if they're going to approve a Days Gone 2 it's going to be from them and the thing is I mean yeah money talks obviously so when a big publisher sees that a game does very well on day one that is what is more than likely going to encourage them to green light a potential sequel. I mean, that's just kind of obvious, right? Um, but you as a consumer, it's not necessarily, it's not your responsibility to pay full price day one, especially because this is such 
such an expensive hobby nowadays. So um, that's where sometimes Sony and other publishers are in this rock and a hard place with their software where if they take a gamble and e even if a game does well or turns a profit but it's not a huge knockout success, that's where they need to have a, a long, hard conversation and really think about does it make sense to give this game another chance or this franchise rather and that's where days gone to didn't get that opportunity in fact a lot of games you could rattle off hundreds that didn't get that opportunity um and that's the nature of the business but uh i mean when games do well they get sequels and when they you know come out to lukewarm reception uh oftentimes most publishers don't want to take that risk for what is a multi-million dollar project and that's what <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me that's what days gone was the thing is though over time we see this a lot where once consumers buy the game cheaper or it's available on plus or now and they think oh my gosh the order 1886 it's a great game why haven't why hasn't this gotten a sequel yet but not realizing that when it launched it did pretty poor and that's why so many games are are at the mercy of how they do on day one or those first first few months of uh, being available on the market and that's where you know, subscription services can often actually work to a franchise's advantage by Sony seeing the numbers and seeing how much uh, active playtime are on those titles and then thinking, well, maybe we could actually do something like this, right? That's where over time we can see subscription actually uh, do quite well. That's why Microsoft, despite the fact that they're loss leading with Game Pass in all likelihood, right? Um, they're not making money with Game Pass right now, but it's sustainable and they can loss lead with it for a long time until um, they can figure that out and make it work. And that's where um, certain franchises can do much better than what they normally do off the traditional model. Now, with all that out of the way, it is time to get to Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. If you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel, a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to pay for your games. Those are all the news stories that I want to talk about with you all from this past week. Our Tuesday video was my first seven PS5 Platinum Trophies. Kind of a trophy update conversation type thing, right? We did one of those almost a year ago now at this point, and it seems like we do them every year. Um, we'll probably do another trophy challenge at some point. I know a lot of people have been asking for that. It's coming, just not, not soon, but uh, this coming Tuesday, we've got a project that I'm working on that is... Uh, the video is turning out to be like 25, 30 minutes long. I'm trying to get it down. I don't want it to be that long, but that will be this coming Tuesday. And that's all I've got for you for now, at least. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday.